Uh, the first speaker uh, today uh, is Sarah Tickman from the Welcome Sagner Institute, and she's going to uh, present the work on human development, one cell at a time. Sarah. Can, can everybody hear me? I oh, am, yeah, okay. Um, so uh, thank you, Patrick. Thank you to, to James Prisco Salmon Way for, for inviting me and for the uh, British Society for Developmental Biology for having this lovely um, sort of cozy meeting in this incredible location here and, and the weather along with it. So what I'll be talking about today is really um, uh, two projects that I'll kind of run by you uh, fairly quickly, one published uh, in a journal. That, that's mine. Yeah, thanks. Um, and one that's, that's on BioArchive, um, both uh, looking, taking an integrative view of um, the, the, the single cell resolution genomics data that we've generated in my group and in, um, also in, in other groups over the years in terms of whole systems. And those two whole systems are the immune system on the one hand uh, which is obviously distributed in, in lymphoid and non-lymphoid tissues, and then an entire kind of anatomical structure, which is the limb on the other hand, which is obviously um, kind of one of these classical developmental biology paradigms in, in the model organism community. So just to, to sort of um, uh, frame the, the idea of a human cell atlas in, in across the lifespan, um, I'm going to give you this historical perspective from... Um, the, the developmental biology community here with Sydney saying 20 years ago in, in his Nobel lecture, we need a program of making maps of cells and maps of how cells talk to each other. And the cell map project for which we don't need a model organism will be one of the things to occupy us for the next few decades. Now, I want to hasten to add that, of course, you know, having a cell map of, of the human is incredibly powerful because the medical relevance and so on, and, and we really desperately need that molecular description of our physiology and our development. And having the same thing for model organisms would be at the, with the same quality and the same comprehensive nature um, would make that even more amazingly powerful because we can then leverage all of that, the tools from the model organism community. Now, while that concept of a cell map, you know, has been around for a long time, it really became a concrete kind of possibility at this very detailed molecular level when uh, the resolution revolution in genomics came online, single cell genomics, spatial genomics, the powerful computational and statistical methods basically to, to stitch those data sets together and interpret them. And that's, um, and so around late 2015, early 2016, when I moved to my current job as head of the cellular genetics department at the Sanger Institute, um, Aviv Regev and I got together. I reached out to her and said, should we do this as an international consortium? This is a big project. Um, it's something that the community needs to do in a collaborative way. We can create a, a, a cell map together, and that's really when this sort of international consortium um, took shape. And it's um, a, a, a bottom-up initiative. So it's um, the, the scientific community that's driving this, really. And then getting uh, collaborators, funders, and so on uh, publishers, editors, and so on, enthused about it. And that's how it started, and that's how it continues today. And so many of you are already part of that community, and if you're not, I encourage you to sign up at humansoutlast.org slash join hyphen HCA. And it's a very easy uh, process to sign up, and you'll get information about meetings, um, funding opportunities, uh, um, virtual meetings, physical meetings, and so on and so forth. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to give you two tastes of what uh, a human developmental cell atlas kind of in this day and age looks like. And, and as I said, we're now at the point, you know, where we've generated huge amounts of data across the community. So can we sort of assemble this data and start putting the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together to get an integrated view of the immune system and... Um, and develop and, and the developing limb. And, and so these sort of get, get to the sort of the next stage of a more comprehensive view. And obviously the human embryo and fetus is amazing for this because of the small size of the samples as compared to an entire adult human being. Um, and uh, the, the, the immune system uh, basically, you know, starts in, in, in its 
early instances in, in the York sac and aortic anatomies and nephros where you've got um, sort of macrophage and, and stem cell populations emerging initially, then moves in human to the liver um, where, where there's sort of comprehensive hematopoiesis begins and then shifts the bone marrow in second trimester. And then you've got the thymus that's responsible for T cell development, spleen and lymph nodes, and then the peripheral organs where the cells kind of migrate out and, and go through several stages of maturation. And, and this happens um, sort of from four post-conception weeks all the way up to after birth in human. And I should say that compared to the mouse, the immune system actually is, is, is sort of quite fast evolving across, across organisms, just like the reproductive system. And so there are a lot of differences both in, in the tempo of the development and in the precise cellular and molecular details, but I won't go into that in this talk. Um, well, for instance, the bone marrow doesn't kick in until after birth in mouse. So we are kind of born as more mature uh, than a mouse with respect to our immune system. Um, if you look at a baby and its sort of motor coordination, that's not the case compared to a mouse that's scurrying around. So they're kind of different times that different systems are developing, uh, the immune system versus, versus limb and coordination. So these two systems are quite different in terms of their analogies and conservation to, to rodent models. So the, um, the, the questions in terms of understanding uh, the immune system are, are, uh, you know, ha are at multiple levels. One is at the level of individual cells and their identity and how that identity changes over time, how it changes in terms of niches and space, and um, that's both in the hematopoietic organs and in the peripheral organs, the, the, the lymphoid tissues, primary, secondary, and so on and in the peripheral organs. And here are some of the papers that Maslifa Hanifa's group and my have collaborated on over the years. And I want to emphasize that all this work is, is really a team of teams effort, very closely in, in close partnership with Mas, who, who, whom I've worked with on human development since our, our initial placenta project that was published in Nature in 2018, where we we're trying to understand the maternal fetal immune system. And that intellectual partnership has been absolutely fantastic with her group. and. Uh, you know, we, we couldn't have done it alone, I think, either way. And um, in this project, what we were doing was integrating uh, um, a pub, you know, data from all of our publications and, and external, uh, also outside of, of, of those papers, data sets, and then generating uh, data in particular for, for, for some organs like the spleen and lymph nodes, also as uh, chemistries for, for TCR repertoire sequencing and spatial transcriptomics and spatial transcriptomics for lymphoid organs and gut in particular. And this is over a million cells. You can see it's a huge data science exercise, and I really want to give a, a massive shout out to, to Chen Chu Suo and Emma Dan, who are the two PhD students, one clinical, one non-clinical, who, who spearheaded this effort um, because it's just incredible uh, complexity of data to, to put together and that they, they, um, they worked through this with, with a lot of creativity um, to, to uh, study the, the, um, the development of, of cell types across lymphoid tissues and, 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 and as they migrate out to the periphery and discovered one of the discoveries I want to highlight. So this was published in, in Science in May and it was a bundle along with three cross-tissue papers on, on, on uh, adult tissues. Um, and, and one of the discoveries that came out was that uh, B cells develop not only in, in the place that, that we all kind of are familiar with the liver and the bone marrow, which is the, the primary um, organs that are familiar, but also in, in unexpected and surprising places um, like thymus, spleen, and gut. And the, the gut was particularly shocking to me, and we kind of want to really, you know, check that this isn't an artifact and uh, gain confidence that, that this process is happening in a completely unexpected place. And I want to emphasize the power of the data to telling you um, sort of uh, 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 things that you're not necessarily looking for. So we, we can also um, look for, for um, you know, using non-negative matrix factorization, look for modules of cells um, that are co-occurring in tissues. And this, was, this is one, one such module that popped out. This approach also gives us um, a, 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 an automatic uh, uh, mapping of tissue architecture and space in this Visium data set. So using cell to location non-negative matrix factorization, looking for modules of co-occurring cells, we are able to see that there are B cell progenitors and, and then all the way up to the, the mature naive cell type in, in um, 
the sort of whole trajectory in all of these tissues and validated it by fish, which is what you're seeing here, where you're seeing RAG and DNTT enzymes in gut tissue sitting outside of the vasculature in, in two dimensions and then um, sort of seeing this in, in, um, in, in, in a tissue section as well. So it's not just an artifact of a particular plane, um, but these are, these are B cells that are developing in the gut tissue, not in the, in the vessels. And, and so you think, so what's the point of this strange thing happening you know, in the human fetus, in a few tissues, in a, in a particular window of developmental time, Sarah. Um, and, and well, what I can say is that we can, um, it allows us to narrow down the signals that are needed to make that developmental process happen. And of course, in, in the bone marrow, it's a particular niche that these cells are seeing, but when we take all these different tissues, we can look for common signals uh, that the, the progenitors are seeing from their surrounding cells. And in particular, there's, there's, a particu there's specific cytokines that are coming from, from NK macrophages and ILC3s that we think are giving those progenitors an alternative niche to the bone marrow stroma. And that obviously has very practical implications. If you want to, for instance, engineer these cells in a dish, um, and, and that's, I mean, everybody can see the utility for B cells and antibody production, um, but it's also in terms of then having a, a system that you can interrogate mechanistically in terms of uh, the individual molecular components, external and cell intrinsic from making these cells. And I guess that's a theme, obviously, of all the, the human cell atlas data, is this in vitro and vivo comparison. I'll come on to that for T cells, where we also saw unconventional T cells um, for the first time in, in human, uh, in human uh, thymus and, 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 and human, um, human tissues. And what we noticed was that um, there is this uh, transcription factor that's been described in mouse, PLZF, CBTB16, that, that's common to um, uh, innate uh, T cell populations and the so-called CDA alpha alpha subpopulations that we described in a uh, thymic developmental paper in Science a few years ago. So there are these three uh, kind of populations that have this particular transcription factor that's known to be uh, in, in, in stimulated by TT cross presentation, and what we were also able to um, to kind of track down because we had the the T cell receptor VDJ sequencing data was that these three subpopulations have unusual repertoires of of the T cells, and the 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 the, the T cell repertoire is a kind of barcode or of the lineage of the cells and can tell us which cells these. What are the progenitors of these cells? It's a kind of intrinsic biological barcode or lineaging system, if you like. Um, and what we saw was that these, these populations, type 1 and 8, CD alpha, alpha, and type 3 and 8, if we plot the, the repertoire of segments, they are closer to the progenitors, which are these double positive cells, and we're plotting the repertoires here in PCA space as an, an, an ensemble. Um, so they're closer to progenitors than the... Um, conventional killer T cells, helper T cells, and regular T cells, which are kind of more um, down the line and, and sort of de developing for longer, in, in a sense, than these unconventional T cells. And integrating that information with, with evidence from the mouse, we hypothesize that these cells um, that have this, this uh, transcriptional module upregulation are developing through TT cross-presentation rather than thymic epithelial cell T uh, cross-presentation, which is the way that conventional T cells develop in the thymic cortex and the, the medulla. And um, we're able to then uh, interrogate this in the dish using an artificial thymic organoid system, and in, in particular the one developed by Gay Crooks that has a human uh, delta-4 ligand engineered into mouse stromal cells. And in that system, which we, which we kind of assayed or benchmarked by single-cell RNA sequencing, what we see is that the cells are actually uh, innate-like, like those three populations I said. They're not mature killer T cells, like a natural thymus kind of in the adult pumps out mostly, and which has been kind of described in terms of the killing properties of the cells that come out of the system, but they, are, they, they have those killing properties, but their identity is more like these innate fetal uh, immature, if you like, or um, T cells. That when we think the role in the actual fetus, the natural role isn't just the sort of uh, uh, recognizing challenges like it is like the, the mature cells are in our body, but it's also contributing to development in the sense of the signals that they're sending to surrounding tissues, 
and um, the sort of mopping up of, of, of debris and so on. So it's not just um, a, a, a sort of immune function. So in summary, the two parts that I talked about was discovering biological processes in unexpected places and, and finding B lymphopoiesis in spleen and gut and so on, which was um, you know, quite very surprising. And, um, and, and, and I've explained how, how that may be uh, used in a, in a practical sense. And also for the unconventional T cell cross presentation, how we can use the in vivo and vitro comparison as a virtual cycle to understand also why these T cells are, are um, evolving through TT cross presentation, which is, I should explain, is hypothetically what's happening in the organoid system because the stromal cells die away after a few weeks and what you're left with is developing thymocytes. And so we hypothesize that cellular mechanism is what's happening both in the dish and in the, in the developing thymus where the T cells are kind of evolving in parallel with the thymocytes in, in first uh, trimester and second trimester. And I've already given a shout out to the two amazing students who, who uh, did this work. There are other members of my group here who contribute, including Pong, whom, whom, who's here, and I'll mention in the next part, Muzz's group, Mena Clapworthy, and, and, and John Marioni, and the um, collaborators at, at, in the core facilities who've been amazing in this work. And this is, as, as I mentioned, this is published work. So, I, so basically, this is to give you a flavor of how you can, what you can learn from integrating data uh, from different tissues and, and different modalities, basically, um, as well as the in vitro and vivo comparison, and to give you a kind of flavor of, of the, the, the where we're at in terms of integrating um, sort of multi-tissue analyses. The limb is, I want to go on to next, is a, a slightly different case because it's a, it's a single sort of physical structure. And we start off here with, with um, six post-conception week, first trimester limb bud, and then went on to about nine post-conception weeks where it's really a, a developing limb with uh, digit formation and so on. So that's the kind of uh, late first trimester window that we're looking at here, which is later than what the, the um, kind of classical um, model organism people have been looking at. And, and what this, uh, this, is, this is on BioArchive, and this is Peng Hei, who's, who's here and has a poster, um, and it has also been collaborating with um, Emma Rollins on lung development, is one of the, the key drivers of this project. And of course, he came from doing a PhD with Barbara Wald at Caltech on mouse limb development. And then looking at human limb development was able to uh, kind of intellectually dissect all of the different lineages, in, you know, including the muscle, which is what we we're focusing on in the first place, but also osteochondral, um, all the fibroblast populations, and then, of course, the, the tendons and, and, um, uh, 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 and, and, the, and the skin cells that are surrounding it. So you have here kind of different, many different lineages that are squashed together in one structure and that are talking to each other as they, as they develop going forwards. Just very, at a very high level, you know, what you can see is obviously over gestational time, you've got fewer of the progenitors, which are kind of in the middle of this two-dimensional UMAP projection. You've got more of the mature cell states, which are sort of towards the edges here. Um, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but what you can appreciate is the, the, the level of depth and information that this gives you about the development of different lineages. And in particular, what we went into in detail is the, the muscle lineage and the fact that there are two sort of um, progenitor pathways that are used to make mature um, myocytes and ultimately myotubes during in, in uh, the human limb and, and then drilled into specific transcription factors that are regulating that. So it's musculin, basically, which we, we knock down in, in, in in vitro cell line and in primary uh, fetal, embryonic fetal myocytes, uh, muscles, muscle progenitors to show that it's responsible for maintenance of the stem cell state. So... Um, uh, you know, the, the, the level of detail then about individual factors and regulators also pops out in other lineages. Um, what I want to emphasize here is really the integration of, of spatial data with single cell data again and what the, the, the value that can bring to the table. Um, and this spatial distribution of cell types is, um, is uh, you know, really enlightening not only for the limb bud and digit development, but also when you, um, I just want to illustrate that you can sort of assemble the, um, or stitch together the, the individual Visium slides for a large sample, because obviously each one is half a centimeter squared. 
and then put it together to have essentially what really is a complete cell atlas of a, of a 2D section um, through, the, through the limb kind of in, in, in one orientation. And what that gives you for, for, late development, for, for later development, so as I said, this is here later post-conception week eight, then the classical kind of limb bud that many of you might be used to thinking about. But what, what it gives us is uh, basically a, a very fine-grained kind of um, assignment of cell types like perineurofibroblasts, uh, perimysium, and these essentially sort of or orthopedics essentially at the, the cell and molecular level, uh, which we, which is very, there's very little data actually on some of these cell populations. And it's very hard to, to predict them from the suspension cell data alone. But when you see where they are in the, the 2D space, then it becomes very clear what the identities of these populations are. And we can then have this full molecular breadth description in, in, um, in, in developmental time and in space. And um, I'm, I'm going to go, go through this at a very high level. When, when we got the reviewers' comments back for this, so the initial manuscript is online, then what um, there were was one or two reviewers particularly who were very obsessed with models of uh, zonation and morphogen gradients and, and transcription factors and so on were saying, okay, there's these three models, like which one does your data support, you know? Um, is it this one or is it this one? And no, this one is out of date. You can't use this word, absolutely not. You know, forbidden, forbidden to use the word progress zone. That's not in fashion anymore and so on. And really what, what um, you know, what the spatial data, I mean, one thing I want to say is that it's slightly later than these developmental models. And the other, the other thing to emphasize is that you get, of course, this comprehensive unbiased view of the signaling factors. And there'll be, what you'll have is both the, the you know, retinoic acid signaling from proximal to distal, but you'll then also get that coming up for digit development. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's an overview picture that gives you a comprehensive view, not, you know, we don't have the tools of the, the lineage tracing and the the perturbations, but it gives you this, this overview that tells you where different signals are used spatially and at what time. And, um, and, and, and so there's, you know, you can plot what Pong did was plot the synthesis genes, retinoic acid uptake, degradation, and show that yes, there is some signal, you know, that's, that's coming from, from proximal, but then you also have this, this um, very distal signal where the digits are developing. Similar for um, the, the FGF signaling, you know, that, that there's been kind of dissected in so much detail, we can, we can plot where the receptors are expressed and where the, the, the secreted signals are expressed and then show that you've got um, centers, if you like, where there's signals coming from, from, from muscle development, but then again also uh, 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 distal centers that are related to digit morphogenesis and where the, 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 there's an you know, integration of signals for the receptor. And this really brings us, so I've talked about the, the benefit of, of studying development for in vitro uh, assessment of models, in vitro engineering, and we've seen a lot of this uh, in the talks at this meeting. And there's obviously also, as we've heard earlier, kind of massive uh, utility in terms of understanding human genetic variations and, and syndromes and, 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 and diseases and so on. And in, in this data, uh, one, one example is digit morphogenesis that uh, Sid Lawrence, who's a, uh, a clinician scientist with an orthopedics background in my group, went into in detail, is calculating the, um, the, the, the uh, difference between the signals that are in the interdigit space and, uh, uh, versus the digits. And here you can see we can, uh, it, you know, it's very clear which signals are promoting digit survival and these genes um, you know, cytochromes, transcription factors, IRX family transcription factors versus the ones that are promoting interdigital death, um, BMP, uh, CCL2, and so on, that are in, the, in that very proximal kind of interdigital region. And we can link those then uh, to, to uh, syndromes, brachydactylies and, and syndactylies and so on, that lead to, to um, unusual uh, digit structures. And so it gives us that sort of quantitative understanding. So I just want to summarize here, we can integrate single cell and spatial data sets to really make a comprehensive cell atlas. We can characterize known and also new transcription factor and um, signaling patterns and link to, to syndromes. And I want to thank Pong and Sid 
uh, and also Hong Bo Shang, um, who was a collaborator, a former postdoc of mine who moved to Sun Yat-sen University as a professor, and Bao Shang from his group. These are fantastic collaborators. And of course, for all of this work, I want to give a huge shout out to the women who donated their tissue. And to me, all of this work is very closely related to women's health and understanding what are the medications and what are the uh, systems that we can use uh, for, for women's pregnancy. Because of course, the, this is the, the tissue from the women. We want to understand what can impact the fetus and what can impact uh, the, the, the mother during pregnancy in order to be able to de develop a next generation medicine for maternal fetal health. So just to summarize again, I've talked about the human developmental cell atlas era of cross tissue characterization integration where we have multiple developmental time points. We can compare in vitro and in vivo data uh, in an iterative way to understand uh, where cells and molecules act over time. And I'll finish there, say thank you and take any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Any on the live stream? No, not yet. So may I start um, on the limb uh, pattern? When you infer the signaling activity, yep. how much of the data you have to include apart from the ligand receptor? Do you include the response gene yeah. and the co-receptor and the antagonist yes. and all add up together yes. so that you can generate an activity status? Yes. Yeah, okay. So to be clear, we use cell phone DB, which is the, the uh, statistical framework that we first developed from a turtle fetal interface. Mm -hmm. And in that first iteration in 2018, we didn't have spatial data, so we weren't using co-localization. But already from the beginning, I have a background in biophysics. Mm -hmm. My, the, the, the structure of the receptor ligand complexes take into account subunit stoichiometry. Right. And we take into account um, the, the uh, also now, Roser Ventotormo's group, who's a former postdoc of mine who started this work, her group has developed uh, an integration with the Dorothea framework for taking into account the expression module downstream of the receptor, so okay. to make sure that the signaling pathway is active. Yeah. yeah. Good, good. I think that is critical. Otherwise, you cannot infer the activity simply based on transcription. Correct. I mean, you can, yeah. you can develop a hypothesis. Yeah. You have more confidence if you yeah. have the activity and the yeah. proximity and so on. Yeah. Any other question? So what do you think uh, is the future of the South Atlas? Especially their period of development that we do not have natural biospecimen. How could you or how could we get information on the South Atlas for this missing part? Yeah, I mean, the particularly challenging parts, just to be clear, are the early, like the early prior one. to six post conception weeks, let's say, the uh, early it, 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 where, where they're, you know, it's hard to get samples and then, and I think there, the, the in vitro systems you know, are um, amazing opportunities and, and it's fantastic to have so many people here who are working on those systems. And, and um, I mean, particularly pre-implantation obviously has been going for a long time, but then also gastrulation mm. and so on. And, and then third trimester. Okay. Uh, like second half of second trimester and third trimester is hard yeah. to access. Yeah. Um, you know, but there are also uh, uh, opportunities to get insights into tissues from, from those okay. stages. All right. yeah. Yeah. All right, I think we have uh, all the time we have. Let's move on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.